Then there's the other line Snake says that could be considered a different category of deception. Your sense is deceiving you. This is outright stated about Raiden and the Colonel. Raiden, about this Colonel of yours. I found out where he is. Where? Inside Arsenal. What? I've checked out all the possibilities, but I keep coming back to Arsenal. It isn't a relay point, it's the origin of the signal. Hmm. And the encryption protocol it uses is exactly the same as that of Arsenal's AI, the so-called GW. What the hell does this mean? I think it means you've been talking to an AI. That's impossible. The Colonel probably isn't GW per se. GW was most likely stimulating cortical activity in the dormant part of your brain through signal manipulation of your own nanomachines. The Colonel is, in part, your own creation, cobbled together from expectations and experience. That's crazy! But it's probably the truth. The virus may be starting to affect GW, which would explain the Colonel's behavior. It was all an illusion? Everything I've done so far? Raiden, Snake, what's happening around here? I don't know. What I do know is that you're standing right here in front of me. Not an illusion. Flesh and blood. Huh? As I said in my Matrix retrospective, one of the things the Matrix seemed to have messed up was interpreting Baudrillard's work Simulacra and Simulation wrong. Baudrillard claimed they misinterpreted it because in the Matrix movie, once you know you're in the Matrix and get out, the illusion is dispelled. It's the same as Aristotle's idea of the cave, and thus more of a classical black and white problem, instead of a grey postmodern exploration of the simulation argument. It's all just one big lie by a single entity, not a sea of them coming from every direction. But Metal Gear Solid 2, on the other hand, is that story about the sea of lies and is much more complex. There are details in the story I have not yet mentioned that go one step beyond just lies. They are things that are completely unknowable, some of them paradoxes. Events that don't follow the eternal logic of the story, but were done intentionally to illustrate the theme of there being no right answer or no absolute reality. One of them is Fortune's powers. Oh, no. Ocelot near the end of the game is able to shoot Fortune when no one else could, and he explains that her psychic powers were actually staged and simulated through technology. You're no Lady Luck. You have nothing that we didn't give you. Do you know why no bullet could hit you? It wasn't magic, or some New Age mumbo-jumbo. Certainly wasn't your psychic talents. It was all staged by the Patriots. Staged? You were being shielded by the electromagnetic weapons technology that the Patriots developed. This is the little gizmo. There's no such thing as miracles or the supernatural. Only cutting-edge technology. Bastard. But she still somehow uses them minutes later after Ocelot presumably turned them off. Fortune! You idiot! Get the hell away from there! I told you, your luck's run out. Take your reward. It's all the payload Ray has. Die! Everybody down! So that doesn't make any sense. If her powers were never real like Ocelot said, she couldn't have been able to deflect Ray's payload. But if her powers were real all along, Ocelot never would have been able to shoot her. So there is no right answer. Sure, you could make up something as an explanation, but there's no basis for it in the story. It's at least unknowable. I'd like to take a moment to draw attention to this line Ocelot this said during his speech to Fortune. There's no such thing as miracles or the supernatural. Only cutting-edge technology. 
It's become a kind of infamous line in the series, and it's completely demonstrably false in the series' own universe. Metal Gear Solid has always had a supernatural element in pretty much every entry, whether we're talking about Psycho Manus and Raven in Metal Gear Solid 1, Vamp in Metal Gear Solid 2, The Sorrow in Metal Gear Solid 3, or I could go on. Not to mention, Fortune seems to be proving him wrong with her powers after he makes this statement, and don't forget that Ocelot himself is somehow possessed by Liquid's arm also immediately after that. Even if you accept explanations in Metal Gear Solid 4 for a few of these things, many are never even attempted to be retconned, and Ocelot personally worked with Psycho Mantis just in the previous game. So the way I look at it, clearly in the context of all of Metal Gear Solid up until this point, this line is supposed to be wrong, and represents just another layer of falsehood that Kojima is throwing at the player. And fortune aside, Vamp and Ocelot's arm are never presented in Metal Gear Solid 2 as anything other than the supernatural. So this just seems to be more evidence that Metal Gear Solid 4 was a story Kojima forced to make his fans happy by giving them the explanation they wanted, regardless of if it fits his original vision. Another paradox, probably the most interesting one, is the final series of conversations with Rose. Rose near the end of the game reveals she's a spy for the Patriots and is pregnant before being cut off strangely. Hey, I understand, but I have nothing left to- Jack! What? I'm... I'm carrying... I'm pregnant, Jack. Rose! What's going on? Raiden is then told that the colonel is an AI and going crazy because of the virus. I think it means you've been talking to an AI. The virus may be starting to affect GW, which would explain the colonel's behavior. Next, he's told a ruse by the colonel that Rose is being held hostage, which gets him to question if Rose is real too. Raiden, they've got Rose. What? Rose is being held in the holds. It's a trap. Help! Rose! Raiden. Get a grip. But Snake, it's a trap. Since the Colonel doesn't exist, there's no way he can take Rose hostage. Yeah, you're right. I am right. Okay. Uh, does Rose exist? Don't be weird. She's your... What if I've never really met her? What? If the Colonel is something that I partly dreamt up, then everything I remember about her could be... Don't jump to conclusions. Then we have the AI conversation, during which Rose and Colonel both seem to be AIs, with Rose clearly referring to herself as such, on top of having knowledge of the conversations so far. All this you used to struggle with. Now, we think for you. We are your guardians, after all. You fell in love with me just as you were meant to, after all. Isn't that right, Jack? You never made a conscious attempt to reach out to me. The only time you did was when I gave you no choice but to do so. I was just trying not to... What? Trying not to hurt me? Dear, the one you were trying not to hurt was yourself. But somehow, after all of these events, Rose stands in front of Raiden at the end of the game, presumably pregnant, presumably real, and has a conversation that shows that she at least has knowledge of a couple key important codec conversations. Do you remember this place? Of course. This is where we first met. I remember now. Mm -hmm. Today is the day I met you. <laughs> That's it. There is no clear-cut answer that can explain how all of this makes sense. The best explanation I can think of is that the real Rose left after the spy confession and reappeared at the end of the game, but there are still too many details that call this into question. The final conversation with quote-unquote normal Rose in Arsenal cuts out in a way that makes it seem like she could have been an AI being affected by the virus. Could it have actually been some kind of transmission problem? No. Remember, Raiden is on top of the signal, and we know the virus was seemingly affecting the colonel. I say seemingly because we also know that the virus itself was staged, so maybe that doesn't tell us anything. Then you have to ask, where was Rose during the game? We don't know. How did she get to Federal Hall in time for the end? We don't know that either. Did the Patriots but ever want her to just together, walk away? Oh. But an even better question is, if the AI seems to have pretty thorough knowledge of the codec conversations, and Rose clearly knows all the relevant conversations for her dialogue, can you even be sure which one was talking to Raiden at most of the points in the game? You can't, and there's no way to know. If it weren't for that coincidence, we wouldn't be together. I know. I'm sorry, Jack. I'm taking up your time again. What? Take care. But, once again, that's not the point. Rose, however, does spell out the message Kojima was trying to communicate through her character. See me for what I am, okay? I 
know. The whole ending sequence really is surreal, and there's a lot of details I never even really noticed until I read some things on MetaGearSolid.org, so I'm going to mention them here. Did you ever notice the people moving really slowly during the final sequence at the end of the game? Maybe it's a stylistic choice, sure, but then why are the police all around Federal Hall and not around Snake and Raiden like, what the hell happened here, who are you, and why should we not arrest or shoot you? In fact, considering Arsenal just blew through the city minutes earlier, people sure are walking around like it's a normal day. And it's not just the ending sequence that's surreal. Remember the arena in the Ray fight? It's a VR stage from the VR Missions game on the PS1. How does Raiden get there? We see him go up a ladder and he's magically there, no hatch or anything. People seem to appear out of nowhere and everyone leaves the area off screen. Was it even real? Remember back when Raiden was naked in the sealed corridor? He turns around, we see nothing. It cuts to Raiden, then back to where he was looking and bam, Snake is there, and his bandana is even moving like there's a breeze in a sealed corridor. If you run out of ammo, you can have mine. You got enough? Absolutely. Infinite ammo. There's a popular interpretation that the game takes place in a VR simulation of some kind, but I strongly disagree. These things I just mentioned can be used to question if the mission took place in the real world in the story, but that's all by design. Remember, there's no such thing in the world as absolute reality. If the answer is that the whole thing was just in VR, it undercuts this idea, because it would point to there being a single right answer like in The Matrix, but that's clearly not the case here. So maybe you think given all that, Kojima is just using the no absolute reality theme within a VR simulation then. Not so fast. There are plenty of other clues in the story that it couldn't have all happened in VR. If we believe the AI about the S3 plan, then it makes no sense for the entire thing to be simulated because that's not a very good way to test such an all-encompassing method of controlling human consciousness. Your persona, experiences, triumphs, and defeats are nothing but byproducts. The real objective was ensuring that we could generate and manipulate them. It's taken a lot of time and money, but it was well worth it considering the results. Metal Gear has commented about the importance of real-world data to back up theory before. So they developed a new type of nuclear weapon in a VR testing lab, huh? Yes, but you can't use virtual data on a battlefield. They would need actual launch data. These are some of the supercomputers. If you link these, you can test everything in a virtual environment. But it's all just theoretical. So, this exercise was designed to test the real thing. And you could care less about what happens to everybody else, huh? Well, if you give me the optic disc, I might consider saving them. What are you talking about? Metal Gear's test data. Donald was supposed to bring it back. I don't have it. I see. Oh well, that's okay. But Metal Gear Solid 2's lines about VR and Raiden's character arc are the best argument against this theory by far. Raiden first feels confident about his mission because he's done a lot of VR and references feeling like Snake without naming him. All right, Raiden. You've already covered infiltration in VR training. I've completed 300 missions in VR. I feel like some kind of legendary mercenary. This is actually one of the pieces of evidence VR theorists like Wolf at MetagearSolid.org use to indicate the game takes place in VR, because Raiden won't say this if you start a subsequent game at the plant chapter and not the tanker. But the problem is that, like so many other pieces of evidence for this theory, it can be explained by several other factors. Kojima uses fourth wall breaking nods often. He also uses fourth wall commentary on the player a lot during the game. My role? Why do you keep saying that? Why not? This is a type of role-playing game. I wonder if you would have preferred a fantasy setting. And there's always the fact that the game is supposed to be about the uncertainty of the truth. But the rest of the dialogue in the game really doesn't yeah, leave much room for speculation on this. Trials. Early on, Snake asks Raiden about That's field about experience, IT and Raiden replies right. talking about VR. Any field experience? No, not really. So this is your first. I've had extensive training, the kind that's indistinguishable from the real thing. Like what? Sneaking mission 60, weapons 80, advanced VR, huh? But realistic in every way. A virtual grunt of the digital age, that's just great. That's far more effective than live exercises. You don't get injured in VR, do you? Every year a few soldiers die in field exercises. 
There's pain sensation in VR and even a sense of reality and urgency. The only difference is it isn't actually happening. That's the way they want you to think, to remove you from the fear that goes with battle situations. War is a video game. What better way to raise the ultimate soldier? Every detail in this conversation is important. Raiden defends VR for one thing. It's a part of his identity. Remember, it made him cocky at the start of the mission. Snake, the actual legendary mercenary, scoffs at it. Snake also mentions you don't get injured, nobody dies, and his lines about them using VR to try and remove the fear of battle situations is very important. Then Raiden drops this great line linking VR to deception. So you're saying that VR training is some kind of mind control? VR theorists like Wolf might argue that the powers of members of Dead Cell, like Vamp and Fortune, seem too crazy to not lend themselves to the VR theory. They're supposed to get the player to question if the mission in the game is supposed to be in the real world for Raiden. This line of reasoning argues against what the game itself says. Pay attention to some of the lines Snake says. The way he moved didn't seem human. You won't see that in VR, I guarantee. What is he? One of the members of Dead Cell. Dead Cell? Him? A special forces unit created by ex-president George Sears. The name was originally intended to reflect its anti-terrorist functions. The unit would launch unannounced assaults on government complexes for the ultimate terrorism simulation. They were needed to show VR troopers like you how to deal with the real thing. But around the time their original leader died in prison, the unit began to unravel. They were always close to the edge, but they became more and more extreme, began to go after U.S. allies, even civilians. We estimate that no fewer than 100 people died as a result of accidents the Dead Cell arranged on their own. So according to Snake, members of Dead Cell are meant to show VR-trained soldiers like Raiden how to deal with the real thing, and that you won't see anything like them in VR. Even the backstory of Dead Cell fits this line perfectly. They originally did staged incidents, but then they actually did real ones. In other words, like Raiden, they went from a simulation to reality. These lines all seem to argue that the Big Shell mission is real in a very consistent way that shouldn't be ignored, especially considering that Snake is the one who dishes out the themes in this game. And we're just getting started. So, first Raiden sees what Vamp can do, then Snake says all this stuff VR, about Dead Cell, guaranteed. then Raiden witnesses what Fortune can do. He's told the entire mission is now in his hands, he has to disable the bombs since the seals were wiped out. And then he has this freak out. But I need to ask you something before I go. Make it quick. Who are they? Dead Cell, I mean. They couldn't hit her no matter how hard they tried. And that vampire, too, it's... it's like... it's like being in a nightmare you can't wake up from. Jack, snap out of it. And you, Rose. I can't believe you're on this mission. I keep thinking I'll wake up. Raiden, this is real. And that's why you won't wake up. But nothing seems real. Remember what Snake said about fear? Raiden is afraid, and he seems to be afraid because he hasn't had to face this kind of fear before. Or so he thinks. He doesn't think anything seems real because for him, up until this point, at least as far as the story is telling us right now, VR was his reality. This is the moment when Raiden seems the most unable to handle the situation. The Patriots later reveal that the S3 was to test crisis management capacity. It was an optimal test for S3's crisis management capacity. If the mob could trigger, control, and solve this, it would be ready for any contingency. This is exactly how they wanted it to be for Raiden. Him against all the odds to test the program. Immediately after his freakout, you come across Stillman. Raiden's about to give us a demonstration of how typical American police officers act when they're afraid. Freeze! Don't shoot! Well, okay. He didn't shoot the black guy directly in front of him, so he has some self-control, but you get the idea. He did a similar thing when he confronted Snake after the fight with Vamp. Hold on. I'm not an enemy. Calm down. He was told Stillman would be in strut 3, but he immediately pulls his gun on him and doesn't want him to make any sudden moves. He even waves his gun around and Snake criticizes him. Did I tell you you could move? It's all right. He's not one of the bad guys. Don't go pointing that thing everywhere, kid. All are signs of him being afraid. After Stillman instructs Snake and Raiden on how to dispose of the bombs, he drops an important line. Bomb disposal is a face-off with your own mortality. Don't let the fear get to you. When you give in to the fear, the darkness comes. Ocelot will later say that Fat Man was only present in the mission to test Raiden's progress. Fat Man was a different story. He's one of our own people. A sort of examiner we hired to test the boy's progress before letting him tackle the exercise proper. 
The test seemed to be whether Raiden was ready to handle the fear of a real life or death situation. There's an interesting optional codec call you can get in between defusing the bombs that goes into this a bit. Jack, it must be so nerve wracking to defuse a bomb. Yeah, I'd say so. Okay, that was a stupid thing to say. Sorry. That's all right. It's just that I've never been trained in this stuff. You okay? Are you feeling well? I almost threw up a few times. Oh, Jack. But I'm okay. It's not like I'm in this alone. Oh, yeah, that's true. What do you think about when you're diffusing those things? I don't think so much as remember. And I know that I need to resist that and keep my mind blank. I can't let myself be overwhelmed by the fear. So, am I a part of what you try not to remember? <laughs> I was just kidding. But I guess this isn't a good time for that. No, it is. And I do think about you. I'm trying to remember what's so special about April 30th. Notice that he says he's not alone and thinks about Rose to get him through the situation, even though he's trying not to. If you think back to an earlier conversation, this is why the Patriots put her on the mission in the first place. They knew that she'd be an important motivating factor, even if he didn't realize it yet. I have my own reasons for selecting her for this mission, soldier. Colonel, I fail to see... I know your VR training performance in and out, but sometimes that's not enough. You're familiar with the Shadow Moses incident? You know I covered it in VR. If there's a crucial tactical detail that case taught us, it was the power of the operative's will to survive. I was trained to fight. My personal feelings have no place in a mission. We've learned that it doesn't work that way. And on the field, you need all the help you can get. Right before the final bomb, when Raiden is given a time limit, he still seems afraid. Hurry! What's the remaining time? 400 seconds. 400 seconds? But after he finishes the bomb disposal at the bottom of strut A, and while he's fighting Fortune, the colonel calls him to raise the stakes even more. This time, however, he seems surprised and annoyed, but not afraid. He's more in control. Right, Batman just contacted us directly. Batman called us? Yes. Looks like he placed a bomb on the heliport. He specifically asked for you, right? What? He's killed off Peter. Now he's after you. Why me? How should I know? Look, this is really not a good time for this. The countdown's already begun, right? Great. How much time do I have left? I'll show you the count. 400 seconds remaining. So he's planning on taking this place out. It looks like he has a different agenda from that of Dead Cell. What about backup? None. There's no time. Which type of explosives is it? He didn't say. After this point, I can't recall Raiden really being afraid of this situation, only surprised at worst. There's also a troop of production model rays ahead. How many units? 25, according to Olga. 25? Remember what Snake said about VR, injuries, and death? This line might appear to be superficial, expository even, but it has thematic meaning. During the mission, Raiden crosses the line that separates him from Snake. He goes from believing in safe simulation as superior to facing harsh reality and his own mortality, being afraid and being able to overcome it because of his own will to live for something. That's why Rose is there. She keeps him going. Just before his freak out over whether the mission was real, Raiden was able to believe everything he was told was according to a simulation, likely as a coping mechanism. Is this according to simulation too? What are you talking about? But after he confronts Snake on the Shell 1 and Shell 2 connecting bridge, he seems to know the value of mortality and how irrelevant simulation is when his life is on the line. You can take your simulation and we're out here, we bleed, we die. Likewise, at the beginning of the mission, Raiden thought his duty as a soldier was to be detached, or like in the optional codec call, keep his mind blank. I was trained to fight. My personal feelings have no place in a mission. I don't think so much as remember, and I know that I need to resist that and keep my mind blank. I but later, after the bombs and about halfway through the game on the Shell 1 and Shell 2 connecting bridge, we find out he's different. He challenges the Colonel and Rose on what they tell him for the first time, and it's probably his best moment as a character. Snake and his partner aren't terrorists. Jack, why are you defending them? I look back on what I've done here so far. And things like training and sense of duty alone won't get you through a sneaking mission like this. Jack, are you okay? You need something higher. I can't think of the right word, but it has to be pure will. 
backed up by, by courage, or ideals, or, or something like that. I'd stake my life on it. The solid snake that saved Shadow Moses couldn't turn into a terrorist. The theme about VR in the game is that it, training and sense of duty alone, isn't able to get someone through a real battlefield, like Raiden just said. That's still not enough. You need what Snake has, a reason to fight, a personal one. And until you face your own mortality, you can't realize this. That's what happened to Raiden after all. So how can this theme even exist in the story if in the writer's mind, it's all just VR? It can't, because according to the game, Raiden couldn't have had this change unless, unlike all his previous missions, this one was real. You can take your simulation and we're out here, we bleed, we die.